Beautiful hat. Fashionable glove. The pretty girl has everything. Max Factor is one of the most famous and successful makeup brands in the world. But what happened to them now? Why did they fall from grace? In this video, I'm going to explore the story of Max Factor, one of the most famous makeup brands of all time. Max Factor rose to fame in Hollywood during the golden age of cinema, but their empire eventually crumbled. What caused their downfall? Find out in this video. Max Factor is the cosmetic company most responsible for the growth of the Hollywood film industry. This close connection may be the reason why tales of Masky Million's early life read more like a movie script than actual events. The majority of these tales were first told by Fred E. Baston, who worked in public relations for Max Factor in Hollywood and was the subject of two books about him. However, his memories are not always reliable. In a nutshell, Baston begins by describing Max Factor's humble beginnings in Poland Poland, his five years of military duty in the Russian army, and his later establishing a tiny shop some 200 kilometers from Moscow. According to Baston, Max Factor arrived in America with savings around 40,000 US, but a business partner defrauded him of the majority of his funds and stocks during the Louisiana Purchase Exhibition, popularly known as the St. Louis World's Fair. Max returned to his former trade and started a barber shop at 1513 Biddle Street in St. Louis after becoming significantly poorer. Max traveled to Los Angeles in 1908 in order to work in the film industry. Many factors could have led Max to move to Los Angeles. He might have been hoping for a fresh start after getting remarried in order to avoid the stigma associated with a second wife. He might also have been drawn to Los Angeles by the oil reserves that were discovered in the state of California, which attracted individuals who might have needed a competent barber and perhaps the occasional toupee. Whatever the reason, Max Factor had established Max Factor and Company and opened his barber shop, the Antiseptic Hair Store, at 1204 South Central Avenue by January 1909, three months after moving to LA. As luck would have it, 1908, the year Max Factor moved to LA, was a significant year in the development of the American film industry. Thomas Edison established the Motion Picture Patents Company, commonly referred as the Edison Trust that year. It was headquartered in New Jersey and included the majority of the film studios, top distributors, and Eastman Kodak, which was the country's main source of film material at the time. The trust was created with the purpose of safeguarding Edison's patents and gaining influence over the expanding American motion picture industry. In response to the trust's establishment, a number of independent filmmakers relocated to the West where it was more challenging for MPPC investigators and their agents to conduct business. The Western movie industry continued to expand even after the MPPC patents expired in 1913 thanks to favorable year-round weather and a large variety of shooting sites. Hollywood became a significant hub for film production by 1915 and by the 1920s it was responsible for the majority of American pictures. Between 1910 and 1912, Max Factor is listed in the LA City directories as Barber at 1204 South Central Avenue. However, in 1912, he is also listed as a hair goods at 1210 South Central while continuing to be a barber at his new address at 1223 South Central. By 1913, Max Factor seems to have closed the South Central Barber Shop and is only registered as a seller of hair products. A 1917 company brochure that includes pages of before and after pictures reveals that the company made a variety of wigs, switches, and toupees for men using hair that was imported from Europe. According to Baston, it was wigs that first got Max Factor significantly involved in the California film industry in 1913 when Cecile B. DeMille rented a number of Max Factor wigs for his major motion picture, The Squaw Man. 
According to Baston, Max Factor sold his Supreme brand products, which included henna shampoo, liquid white, rouge face powder, eye makeup, cleansing cream, and lip rouge, along with a variety of accessories like a face powder brush. He also stocks stage makeup from companies like Letcher and Steins. Baston claims that in 1914, a Max Factor expanded the Supreme line to include grease paint. The colors were combined with a foundation of vegetable oils to create the grease paint, which was a cream rather than a stick. It is referred to as a flexible grease paint and was allegedly created to solve issues with stick grease paint's use in motion pictures. As more movie professionals came into Max's shop, he realized that they required a different kind of makeup than just stage makeup, which was just too thick. One eighth of an inch of stage makeup had to be applied, then powdered. It wasn't an issue at the theater where viewers were seated far from the actors, but it didn't work on screen, especially in close-up shots. When it dried, it formed a hard mask and frequently cracked. Even minor cracks could be seen. Actors required makeup that didn't shatter when they expressed themselves and had enough hues to give them a natural appearance rather than a thick mask-like look. According to Baston, Max Factor created this flexible grease paint in 1914. However, according to Max Factor's own writings, the product wasn't actually offered to the film business until 1923 or around nine years later. It was able to provide the first flexible makeup to the industry in 1923, which could be applied very thinly to the skin while still maintaining all the necessary covering and coloring capabilities. It was the first and only action taken at the time to accurately advance theatrical makeup. And I can't imagine having a thick, almost plaster-like mask on my face. According to a 1925 article in the LA Times, flexible grease paint may have been created for the first time in the 20s. The creation of a thin, flexible makeup by Angelo Max Factor is altering the way faces are prepared for the movie and the stage, and he's vying to make LA the hub of the global cosmetics industry. Max Factor is currently negotiating the purchase of a factory where he can produce the article on an enormous scale, as well as of a similar line that he's refined as a result of his discovery, which is anticipated to create a demand in all regions of the world. At the famous player's Lasky studio in Hollywood, Douglas Fairbanks and the company currently acting with him in his new movie are putting the flexible makeup through a rigorous testing. Tests have already demonstrated that the article facilitates registration of the entire face, which was formerly limited only to the eyes and the mouth. The concept of cream grease paint, sometimes known as cream paint or flesh cream, was not new. Before the First World War, numerous makeup manufacturers factors produce comparable goods primarily for actresses to utilize. In spite of this, it was typically sold in pots. Therefore, packing it in tubes seemed to have been novel, and Max Factor reportedly believed it to be way cleaner than the pots. I think it would be too when you squeeze it out versus sticking your hand in a pot. Hollywood began to take makeup more seriously in the 1920s, and studios started to set up departments on their sets with specialized makeup artists. By 1922, Max Factor was referring to his establishment at 326 South Hill Street as the house of makeup, indicating that providing cosmetics to film studios and actors had grown to be a significant portion of his business. And Max Factor ran a research lab along with offering makeup services to movie stars and studios. Second born, Max Factor's son Frank Factor appears to have worked in the lab, but by 1925, the business also had scientist Steve Frenzy on staff. And Max Factor was well positioned to help the film industry in Hollywood when it adopted three new technologies in the second half of the 1920s. Less expensive panoramic film in 1926, sound in 1927, and Technicolor Process 3 film in 1928. He had strong industry connections, a well-stocked laboratory, manufacturing experience, and most importantly, he was located in Hollywood. And Max Factor possessed the connections, technical know-how, and production resources, and manufacture the new types of professional makeup that were necessary for two of these innovations, hand chromatic and technicolor film stocks. 
The Max Factor firm decided to capitalize on the rising popularity of cosmetics in 1927 and launched its Society line. It was developed as a generic cosmetic line and distributed nationally throughout the United States. Therefore, it is not unexpected that early society makeup advertisements focus more on establishing the connection between Max Factor Hollywood and movie stars than on describing the products itself. Max Factor's older children, Frank and Davis Factor, more than likely served as the inspiration for the society line rather than Max himself. The term society was probably chosen because of its connotations of respectability and prestige, which Pons had also adopted when they started utilizing society ladies as product endorsers in 1924. Instead of using the phrase cosmetics, Makeup was used to connect the line with movies and the movie stars who appeared in Max Factor advertisements. People used cosmetics, but movie stars used makeup and color harmony. The Society Makeup Line's foundation was touted as being based on color harmony concepts. Color harmony was regarded by Max Factor as one of the three secrets of makeup. It allowed women who were not familiar with cosmetics to choose the right makeup color for their skin tone. In order to simplify the selection process, given the vast array of possible skin, hair, and eye color combinations, the color harmonies were divided into four general categories based on hair color, blondes, brunettes, redheads, and brownettes. A category created by Max Factor himself with sporadic references to a fifth type, Titian. By completing a questionnaire and sending it to the company, women might receive suggested makeup hues that complemented their skin tone. They would receive some skincare and makeup tips, as well as a copy of the business pamphlet, The New Art of Society Makeup, via return mail. Later versions of this book listed the Max Factor cosmetics most suited to each other of the four types, followed by descriptions of the hair, eye, and complexion colors of movie stars who represented each of the four types. This gave women the option to mimic the makeup of movie stars who they thought had skin tones similar to their own or more frequently to dye their hair and alter their makeup to look more like their favorite actress. Color Harmony's justification appears sound, but the tale of how it came to be seems less convincing when you consider that the majority of movies at the time were black and white. Color Harmony served as a justification for the company's overall composition, as well as another purpose. A sales builder and distributor of Max Factor products recognized the potential sales advantages right away. They believed that Color Harmony increased sales by encouraging women to harmonize their cosmetic purchases purchases or to buy all their cosmetics from one brand as opposed to purchasing them randomly. This served as the makeup equivalent of the skin care routine created by brands like Helena Rubinstein, Elizabeth Arden, and Dorothy Gray to entice clients to purchase all of their skincare needs from a single line. Events occurred in 1928, one year after Max Factor unveiled its society line. That would further solidify the company's link with the motion picture industry. At the Warner Brothers Studios that year, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences experimented with lighting, cameras, film, and makeup. The sole called a Masna test made panachromatic film and iridescent lights industry standards. Max Factor created a makeup that performed well with panachromatic film and iridescent illumination over the four months that the tests were run. The majority of Hollywood studios rapidly adopted panachromatic makeup and then film companies all around the world did the same. 1929 was significant. The Great Depression, which lasted for a significant portion of the following decade, began on October 20th, 1929, with the collapse of Wall Street and into 1930s Hollywood. Hollywood did not have a good beginning in the 30s. All of the movie studios experienced declining profits as the Great Depression got underway, and for them, Paramount Publix, Fox Film, RKO Pictures, and Universal Pictures went into debt and subsequently receivership. Others like Warner Brothers were only able to avoid bankruptcy by making drastic expense cuts. For Max Factor, everything was better with the growing usage of panachromatic film. The majority of film studios worldwide began to use Max Factor makeup. By 1933, the business claimed that 96% of film studios worldwide were using its professional makeup. 
Hollywood studios like Paramount, 20th Century Fox, Radio Pictures, MGM, Columbia, and Warner Brothers hired their actresses to market Max Factor goods in exchange for a small sum of $1, which allowed Max Factor to promote the actresses and their most recent films. Max Factor was able to closely identify its society line with Hollywood and proclaim that it was the cosmetics of the stars, thanks to the free publicity it gave the studios. Max Factor then added movie stars to the 96% statistic, which had a significant marketing impact on the success of the products. Max Factor kept up its close relationship with the film business while also showing interest in the emerging television industry. The business provided makeup for multicolor and technicolor process three film stocks in 1929, as well as early black and white television in 1932. And pancake makeup, and pancake was created in 1936 for Technicolor movies, and it made its debut in 1937's Vogues of 1938. Its significance for the movie business cannot be emphasized. It solved the makeup issues brought on by Technicolor filming and was a significant milestone in the transition from grease paint to more contemporary types of expert makeup. Pancake was added to the company's line of general consumer makeup following its popularity as a professional makeup product to provide softer tones, pan color Cake's palette needs to be altered. Both as a professional makeup and a general makeup, it sold amazingly well. Sales quickly exceeded the combined sales of all other Max Factor cosmetics, which promoted several imitations by other cosmetics companies. And I do love the pancake, so I feel like it's so easy to apply with the sponge. And going into wartime, the developments in Europe made life difficult for the corporation after 1939. Even though America would not officially enter Second World War until December 1941. Unfortunately, I don't know what happened to the Max Factor Studio, which was founded in 1937 and located at 11 Rue Royal in Paris. In order to produce a Max Factor Cosmetics in Britain, a British firm was established in January 1939 and it carried on during the war. Supply shortages, tax rises, and the removal of some products from its inventory all had an impact on company sales. Women were encouraged to utilize refills sold in cardboard boxes as packaging became a significant issue in both Britain and America. For instance, pancake was only offered as a refill in Britain. A variety of items also received military packaging. For instance, from 1943 to 1946, the metal top of True Color lipstick in the United States was changed with a white plastic one. Max Factor also produced camouflage makeup for the U.S. Marine Corps as part of its numerous sacrifices to the American war effort. Following the satisfaction of the unmet demand for cosmetics caused by wartime shortages, cosmetic industries overproduce, leading to a surplus and lack of options for American customers. Gross sales for Max Factor decreased from 17 million in 1946 to 14 million in 1950, while net income also decreased from 2 million to 800,000. Increases in the cost of labor, raw materials, and containers also had an impact on the company's profitability, forcing Max Factor to hike all of its prices in the United States by 10% in October 1950. Even though the company's margins were under further pressure due to its increased usage of expensive television advertisements throughout the 1950s, it was difficult for it to implement more price increases due to the intense competition at the time. Television had a significant impact on cosmetic sales in the United States in the 50s as a mass marketing medium. It was the key factor in the increase of Revlon's market share of American lipstick from 15 to 28% in 1956 and Cody's from 3 to 8%. In the 1950s, lipsticks were a crucial fashion cosmetics, and since Max Factor's lipstick sales in the US remained stagnant at just 11.2%, the company had to invest more in the sector. The situation had slightly improved by 1955, 
Max Factor's net income was 2.4 million, while its gross profit increased to 18 million. Space was already a problem, so the business built a new structure next to the Max Factor Studio on Highland Avenue at 1655 North McCaden Place in Hollywood. The laboratory executive offices, sales, advertising and promotion, and public relations departments were situated there when it first opened in 1956. Max Factor had extensively relied on its connections with Hollywood to market its cosmetics, but this marketing strategy was abandoned in the 1950s with the dissolution of the Hollywood studio systems. Under the studio system, a select few hundred studios who had long-term contracts with their movie stars controlled the creation and distribution of Hollywood movies. These long-term contracts and Max Factor's inexpensive endorsement relationships with Hollywood came to an end with the studio system collapse, which started in early 1948 and was fully accomplished by 1954. Elizabeth Taylor, Esther Williams, Donna Reed, Janet Leigh, Debbie Reynolds and Jane Russell were among the final actresses to advertise Max Factor goods, which appear to include panstick makeup and color fast lipsticks. The company stopped utilizing the slogan Cosmetics for the Stars in 1955, and from that point on, its advertisements began to resemble that of other cosmetic companies. Grease paint and pancake makeup were still produced by Max Factor for the stage and television. The business modified their pancake makeup for the use of black and white television in 1946, and the following year it unveiled Panstick, a creamy, greaseless stick makeup. Professional versions of Panstick like Pancake were modified to make them compatible with black and white and colored film stocks, as well as black and white and subsequently colored television. All of the major American networks used the RCA Victor Standard Transmission Method for color television, therefore Max Factor created a new makeup line exclusively for these televisions in 1954. It was created with the help of the National Broadcasting Company, NBC, Color Research Department on affiliate of RCA and offered as Max Factor's color TV makeup in both pancake and panstick forms. Max Factor moved to strengthen its traditional strength and makeup while attempting to improve those areas in which it was weak. Skin care, hair care, the youth market, men's toiletries, and fragrances. As its ability to call on movie stars to sell its products declined, and competition from other cosmetic companies like Revlon increased, in 1956 the business set up a project development department to help with its process and development of new goods and packaging. The release of high in 1955, the company's first new general makeup line since Society made its debut in 1927 was a significant milestone for Max Factor in the 1950s. As previously indicated, Max Factor asserted that it was created as a result of the company's investigation into cosmetics for color television. Foundations and face powders, Max Factor continued to place a lot of emphasis on the company's best-selling pancake makeup, but it was now complemented by the hand stick which was released in 1947, and then it was produced as a general makeup in 1948 in five color harmony and two suntan tones. Panstick could be touched up unlike pancake, which typically needed to be totally replaced when it started to fail. Its rotating base was rotated like a lipstick until the makeup protruded over the case, at which point it was applied on the forehead, nose, cheeks, and chin, blended in with the fingertips in an upward and outward motion from the center of the face and then lightly dusted with matching powder. In 1953, the same year the Revlon unveiled its Love Pat Compact Powder, Max Factor debuted the Cream Puff Makeup, a product that combined a creamy makeup base with powder. Max Factor issued 400,000 shares of their stock to public offering on April 11, 1961, allowing the business to trade on the New York Stock Exchange. The corporation began to focus more on growth while taking the share price into account when making decisions. By 1961, the facility in Hawthorne, California had essentially taken over as the center of American 
American manufacturing and profits had risen to a record breaking high of around 63 million. These would expand to over 187 million by 1970, growing at the same time as the significant development and renovation program. As a result of losing its tight ties to Hollywood, Max Factor started to reposition itself as uniquely Californian. California wasn't featured in every Max Factor promotion, but the state's name was used more frequently than any other advertising campaign. The corporate offices were once more moved, this time to Cincinnati after Max Factor was sold to Procter and Gamble in 1991 for more than one billion dollars. Max Factor sales in America were stopped by Procter and Gamble in 2001 due to subpar profits, and the company instead focused on promoting CoverGirl, a brand it acquired in 1988 when it acquired Noxel. Max Factor and CoverGirl were acquired by Cody in 2016 from Procter and Gamble. If this results in a sustained resurgence of Max Factor brand in the United States, only time will tell. And I really do wish they would bring Max Factor back. I wish they did kind of like a vintage revival of some of the products, like the pancake. I don't know. I, I think I like it better than CoverGirl. I bought it on Amazon and apparently they still have it in the UK. And now let's talk about Marilyn Monroe and Max Factor. Marilyn Monroe had fascinating beauty routines, but her signature look relied heavily on the products of one cosmetic brand, Max Factor. Marilyn's vanity was often set up with boxes of pancake foundation in light beige and blended pink, ruby red lipstick to match her sultry attitude, eyeliner for enhancing her round peepers, black mascara, and eyebrow pencils that emphasize her femininity. Marilyn was spotted everywhere from Hollywood day sets to high profile events wearing products from this iconic line, crafting a look entirely unique to Marilyn herself. It became an iconic staple of Marilyn that even after death Decades, it is still popular today. And you can see all of Marilyn's Max Factor makeup at the Max Factor Museum. I think it was over 10 years ago. I wish I could go back and take pictures because now it's just in my memory. I feel like I'd appreciate way more now. Before she was a movie star, she was a Max Factor client in the 1940s. The brand claims that since getting her Max Factor makeover, she has made red lips and crinkled eyes synonymous with vintage Hollywood glitz. Monroe's estate continues to earn millions of dollars annually, even decades after her passing, and Max Factor had to obtain a special license in order to use her in a campaign which also features Norma Jean. Her ruby red lipstick was probably Marilyn Monroe's most recognizable cosmetic that she used. More than 50 years after her passing, the company Max Factor even made her the face of their lipstick range. She also utilized other Max Factor cosmetics in addition to the lipstick. For complete coverage, she used the the foundation, the pancake, and pan stick. And she definitely wore the Max Factor Ruby Red. That is her color. You can still buy that one. And Max Factor has had an incredible journey, and their legacy will be sure to stay alive for centuries to come. From Max Factor's senior beginnings in the 1910s, his rise as a renowned name in film makeup helped make Max Factor what it is today, an iconic beauty empire which continues to wow customers worldwide with its innovative products and techniques. Max Factor was sold several times throughout history and is most recently to Cody. The love Max Factor has earned over the years is unmatched. No matter the new owners, Max Factor will continue to bring people together with their iconic beauty looks for years to come. And let me know if you used to wear Max Factor. Do you miss Max Factor? Do you wish you could still buy it in the United States? Let me know in the comments below. And don't forget to check out my downfall of Revlon video. All right, see you soon. Bye.